you would go ahead and take your Bibles this morning and be turning to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to be focusing our attention in verse 7 in just a few moments. Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 7. I want to say how thankful I am to be here with you this morning. I do consider it a great honor, a great privilege to be here, to be one of your speakers on your lectureship program. And I'm so thankful for the great work that you continue to do here. Appreciate uh, Andy and his good work. Andy was talking about his memory there for just a moment. Uh, when I think about the first time that I met Andy, it wasn't uh, at a wedding. Uh, it was actually at uh, the Memphis School of Preaching that I think we met. Uh, Andy came down for a class one day and uh, was visiting there. And I think we went and played some basketball together and, and, uh, and things along that line. But uh, uh, our, our memories kind of, kind of uh, conflicted there a little bit. But uh, the, the very first time that I ever met Andy, I was very impressed with him. And uh, he mentioned something last night about Preston Silcox and how thankful that he is for him. Uh, I'm thankful for him as well uh, because of the, uh, the men that he influenced like Andy and Chris and Brian Reed and others. Uh, so grateful for the good work that was done there in the Martin, Tennessee area and the young men that have been produced and, uh, and their great work. You know, I have, have admired Andy for a number of years. He does a great job in preaching, but one area that I really admire him is in his writings. And uh, he is a very, very good writer, and I enjoy reading his blog on a regular basis. In fact, I find myself at least once a month uh, using some of his articles in our bulletin down at South Haven. And uh, the members there have been benefiting from his writings as well, and they talk about how much they appreciate them. And I know that you appreciate the good work that he's doing here, along with Jeff and his good family. We appreciate so very much the, uh, the great work that continues to be done uh, by the Phillips Street congregation. Did you know that there are over 780,000 words in the King James Version of the Bible, over 780,000. Have you ever stopped to think about some of the words that are extremely prominent within those 780,000? And then have you ever thought about the words that you really, really enjoy reading? Words like love, and the reason why we enjoy reading and highlighting and circling and underlining some of these words is because of the great thoughts that come with them. When we think about that word love, oftentimes our minds immediately think about the great love that God has for us. You think about the word peace and how it's the opposite of being at war with God. You think about the word forgiveness. And the great thoughts that come with that word, knowing that our sins can be forgiven. You think about the word sanctification and how we are set apart from the world. Or maybe a word like grace, which is getting what we don't deserve. Or a word that's closely tied with it, the word mercy, which means not getting what we do deserve. And there are a number of other words that, that you and I could think about, the word salvation, and how we can be saved from a devil's hell. But there's another word that I want us to center our attention upon this morning. It's a word that in all of its forms is found almost 140 different times in the Word of God. It's the word redemption. You will see it not only as redemption, you'll see it as the word redeem. And then also you'll see it in the past tense with an ED on the end, the word redeemed. You know, sometimes when we think about the word of God, we've heard it described as God's scheme of what? God's scheme of redemption. And that's exactly what the Bible is. It is the unfolding of God's plan of redemption for mankind. And so what we want to do this morning, we want to talk about the truth in regards to redemption. And as we talk about the truth in regards to redemption, we're going to be asking ourselves the question, what is redemption? 
And we're going to be noticing five things in regards to this question for this Bible class hour. We're going to be talking about the price that was paid. We're going to be talking about the product. We're going to be noticing the process. We're going to be talking about the person of redemption. And we're also going to be noticing, first of all, the picture of redemption. Let's go there and notice, first of all, the picture of redemption that's found for us in Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 7. You'll remember there that the Apostle Paul, he says, in whom... We have redemption. When we think about that word redemption, that is a word that carries with it the idea of slavery. It's a word that means to buy back. It means to release from a captive position. It means to pay a ransom price in order to release that individual from slavery. The story is told about a missionary who went into the mission field to do some short-term mission work a few years ago, and he went to West Africa. And as he was there, and, and he was preaching one day, and he had his translator translating for him, He was going through his lesson and he was trying to talk about the word redemption. And he was trying to give them several different definitions of this word. And as he was trying to relay definitions and ideas to them, he started to get these really, really odd looks. And he began to notice, I am not making any sense with these people. And so he looked over at his translator and he asked him, he said, can you discuss the word redemption in your language using concepts that they will understand? You see, this missionary, he made one of the the common mistakes that people from our country make when we go to a foreign land to go and speak. I went to the Philippines, went out of the country for the first time last year. And I, before I went out of town, I called up Billy Bland, one of our teachers from the School of Preaching. And Brother Bland has done all kinds of mission work. And I asked him this particular day, I said, do you have any advice? Any things to remember, things to do, things to not do? And he said, this is what you don't do. He said, when you get up to preach, he said, don't use local sayings that Americans use. Don't use idioms that we would use. And he said, for instance, if you're talking about things that can cause problems, do not get up there and say, well, this is going to open up a can of worms. He said, don't do that. Those people there, they do not understand that concept. That is something local that Americans understand, but most of the time people in foreign lands, they're not going to be able to understand that concept. And so as that preacher from West Africa began to talk, he said, in our country, when we describe the word redemption, he said, we describe it this way, to remove our heads. This missionary, he looked at him, and and he had a puzzled look now. And he said, well, what do you mean to remove our heads? And he said, years ago, many of our ancestors were taken captive. And they were made slaves. And when they were taken captive, they were placed in chains. And they would be taken to the seacoast in order to be dispersed to a number of areas. And one of the things that every single slave had around their neck was this iron collar. And he said as they would go through various villages, there were times that a chief would recognize a friend or a family member, and he would offer to pay a ransom to release that slave out of captivity. Sometimes that ransom could be paid with gold, it could be paid with silver, it could be paid with ivory, it could be paid with with brass, and the list could go on and on. But when that ransom was paid and they were released from captivity, they would remove their heads from that iron collar. 
And so he said, whenever we talk about the word redemption, because slavery is a word that we are accustomed to knowing its background and history because of our families, we simply say that our heads have been removed. When we think about the word redemption today, it was not a brand new word when you get to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. This was a thought that can be found all throughout the Word of God. And the very first time that it's going to be found is all the way back in the book of Exodus. When you come to the end of the book of Genesis, you have there Joseph living and dying peacefully in Egypt. And then when you open up the very first chapter of the book of Exodus, you've got the Israelites. They are living among the Egyptians. Things are going great. The Bible tells us that they are increasing in number. They're being fruitful. They're multiplying. All of this has to deal with their growth. If you look over at Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37, the Bible tells us there that there were 600,000 Israelites who were living in Egypt. Now, the scriptures emphasize the word men, 600,000 men. If you were to take into effect the women and the children, you may have somewhere in the ballpark of 2 million Israelites that are living in Egypt. Well, when you get down to Exodus chapter 1 and verse 8, things are about to change. Let's look there for just a moment. If you'll hold your finger there at Ephesians 1 and verse 7, and let's look there at Exodus chapter 1 and verse 8, let's notice what's about to happen. The Bible tells us that there arose a new Pharaoh over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. A new Pharaoh. You could basically say that there was a new sheriff that was in town. And this guy here, he didn't know about the history that Joseph had with the former Pharaoh. He didn't know about the peaceful living and all of the things that Joseph did for the former leaders of Egypt. This guy, he's going to come in and he's going to have a brand new plan. He has the idea, perhaps, that if these people continue to grow, if they continue to multiply, we're going to have problems on our hands. The Israelites are eventually going to overtake the Egyptians, and so we've got to do something about it. When you look down in the verses to come, especially verses 9 through 12, 9 through 13, you're going to see there that Pharaoh is going to come a great taskmaster to them, a very cruel taskmaster. He's going to be one that's going to place them in bondage. He's going to be one that's going to place all of these stipulations upon them. And he's going to work them like dogs day in and day out. But you know what happens to the Israelites? They continue to grow. They continue to multiply. And then you drop down to verses 15 through 21. He says, we're going to start exterminating some of the children of Israel. We're going to start killing off some of those babies in order to try to reduce that population. But you know what happens? They continue to grow. And by the time we get over to Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6, God has had enough. Let's notice what the scriptures have to say. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Here we have the idea of bondage, the idea of slavery, and the Bible tells us that God is going to redeem them. He is going to buy them back. He's going to release them from that captivity. When we fast forward and we move to the New Testament, in a very similar way, you and I have found ourselves in bondage to sin. And sin, brethren and friends, is the cruelest taskmaster that is known to man. 
When we look over at Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul, he will describe the fact that we are servants of sin. But notice just a few verses later, down in verse 23, how cruel sin is. The wages of sin, the consequences of sin is death. If you look at Romans 8 and verse 2, the law of sin and death. Sin was always designed to produce death. And therefore, because of the bondage that we found ourselves in, we are in need of of redemption. And so number one, when we talk about the picture of redemption, we're looking at the way the Word of God describes it. We're looking at the way that, that the Word of God pictures it for us. But let's move to a second point. And let's talk about the person of redemption. Let's go back there to Ephesians chapter 1. And as you're there in verse 7, notice the very first two words. In whom... We have redemption. Now, who is the whom? Who is the whom? When you look at Ephesians 1 and verse 3, you go back just a little bit in the context. The Apostle Paul is going to let us know who the whom is. Let's see what he has to say. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ. The whom here is Jesus. And one of the great spiritual blessings that you and I have provided through Jesus is redemption. This idea of being bought out, being removed from slavery. Now hold your finger there at Ephesians 1 and verse 7 and let's turn over and look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. And the Apostle Paul is going to give us something else about redemption. He says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption, now watch this, that is in Christ Jesus. Here is the person once again. Now let's look at a parallel passage to this. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at verse 30. Here the Apostle Paul writing once again, but he says, Of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. Watch this last one. And redemption. Did you see the connection that's there? In Christ Jesus, and then the very end, through him we have redemption. You see, Jesus is the common link. In the first century, some have estimated that there were some 20 million slaves. I don't know if that's a very liberal estimate. I don't know if that's a very conservative estimate. But you know, with that estimate being thrown out there, that lets me know that slavery was big business in the first century. It was a common thing. And so to use words like redemption, those individuals could easily relate to the messages that Paul was writing to them. Did you know that in our country, in the 1850s, slavery was big business? In fact, the story is told of a young girl that had been placed up on a slave trader's block. And whenever you were placed on a slave trader's block, you would stand out before the crowd and there would be people that would start making bids on you. And the story is told about this one young girl. She stood up on that block and the bid started. There was one that made a bid over here, another one that made a bid over here, and it was silent for a few minutes. The auctioneer said, going once, going twice. And then there was this man towards the back, this taller gentleman. He raised his hand and he raised the bid. And then somebody else would raise their bid. Somebody else would raise their bid. An the auctioneer would say, going once, going twice. Here was that taller man in the back. He'd raise the bid once again. And this happened over and over and over again. You know what thoughts were going through that slave girl's mind? She said, that guy back there really wants me bad. And finally, that taller gentleman in the back 
won the bid. He was now the owner of this slave girl. She made her way to her new owner and she introduced herself and gave her name. And then he introduced himself. He said, my name is Abraham Lincoln. And I want you to think about what he told her next. He said, young lady, he said, you're free to go and do whatever you want. You're free to go and do whatever you want to say. You're free to go and be who you want to be. She'd never heard anything like that before in her life. You know what she said? She said, I guess I'll go with you. Do you know that because of sin, you and I stand on that slave trader's block? And Jesus is the one who was willing to come to our defense to remove us from captivity, to release us, to buy us back. And so when we talk about the subject of redemption, we see a picture of it, we see the person of it, but let's think about a third thing that redemption provides. We see the price of it. Go back there to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. And let's notice what, uh, what Paul has to say about uh, redemption here. He says, in whom we have redemption, now watch this, through his blood. Did you know that blood has always been a part of God's scheme of redemption? When you go back to the Old Testament and you see those sacrifices that have been given, and you think about all of those different ones, you had peace offerings, you had meal offerings, you had burn offerings, you had sin offerings, you had trespass offerings. And you think about all of those offerings that have been made. You think about all of the blood that had been shed. All of that blood was a, a shadow that would lead us to the blood that Jesus would ultimately shed for our sin. When you move forward and you go over to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, the Bible tells us there that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But then if you look one chapter more in Hebrews 10 and verse 4, he says, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So what kind of blood, whose blood? would be able to redeem mankind? Whose blood would be able to buy us out of that bondage? When you look at John chapter 1 and verse 29, John makes a very interesting statement. He says, Behold the Lamb of God, which is able to take away the sins of the world. You see, Jesus was the only one that could be able to provide the redemption that's needed. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, he tells us that we are bought with a price. But let's look over at 1 Peter chapter 1 for just a moment. And as we think about the price of redemption, this passage here gives us the, the exact price of it. He says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from the vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Only the blood of Jesus would be able to provide that price that was needed to purchase us, to release us from captivity. No other blood would do. Only the blood of our Lord, a blood that was without spot, a blood that was without blemish. But let's look at a fourth thing about redemption. And as we talk about a, a fourth point in regards to this, we go back to Ephesians 1 and verse 7. We see the product 
of redemption. And let's notice what Paul says. He says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Now watch this very next phrase that's highlighted there on the screen. The forgiveness of sins. That's what redemption produces. The forgiveness of my sins, the forgiveness of your sins. Now what does that word forgiveness mean? That word forgiveness is a word that means to dismiss. It's a word that means to release. When one is in bondage, in need of redemption, when he is redeemed, it brings about sweet release. It also means to send away. I want you to consider just a few passages with me for a moment from the Old Testament. And I want you to see if you see these terms, see these definitions floating through these passages. Let's begin first of all by looking at Psalm 103 and verse 12. Here the psalmist says, As far as the east is from the west, so far he hath removed our transgressions from us. When he talks about that great distance from the east, from the west, he says God has removed our transgressions from us. You know what he's done? He's released us from those. He has sent those away. They're no longer on our slate. Let's turn to Micah chapter 7 and verse 19. The prophet says, He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Do we have any one in here that likes to go fishing? Do we have, have any individuals by show of hands? No, nobody. All right, uh, Jeff likes to go fishing. All right, Jeff, you and I need to go sometime. I, I enjoy it. Only get to go maybe once or twice a year. But when you think about going out and fishing, what, what are you doing with that line? You are casting it out into the water in hopes of being able to catch that fish. But when you cast that line out, you are releasing it. You are sending it forth. And so the idea that the prophet here is giving, when we are forgiven of our sins, God is casting it out. He is sending it forth. And you know where he's placing it? He's placing it in the deepest parts of the sea. Why? So that he'll remember it no more. What a comforting thought to think about our sins and when we've been forgiven of them. But let's think about a third passage. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25. Here the prophet says, I, even I, am he that blotted out my transgressions for my own sake and will remember and will not remember thy sins. That idea of blotting out. Do you hear the sound of sending away? Releasing, dismissing through there. When we think about this phrase back there in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, the forgiveness of sins. Did you know that the same Greek word that is used there for forgiveness of sins is the same Greek word that's used in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 that describes the remission of of sins, very same one. You'll remember there at Pentecost, Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of your sins. Do you know that we could insert the word forgiveness there and do no harm whatsoever to the text because it's coming from the same Greek word? He says, for the forgiveness of sins. Now let's think about that English word remission for just a moment. What generally comes to mind when you and I hear the word remission in our thoughts today? 
We generally think about it in regards to cancer, don't we? And one of the words that cancer patients long to hear from their doctor is that your cancer has gone into what? Into remission. You know what that means? Your cancer has been dismissed. It's been released. It's been sent away from your body. Did you know that spiritually, you and I are in need of the greatest remission of all? Because you and I have come in contact with the greatest sickness of all? spiritual cancer known as sin. And we need a release. We need a dismissal. We need a sending away of sin. And the only way that that is made possible is through Jesus. He's the one that provides the forgiveness of sins. When we think about the product of redemption, what a great product it produces, knowing that our sins can be forgiven. In Matthew 26 and verse 28, he says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which was shed for many. Why? For the remission, for the forgiveness of sins. But as we start to close our study this morning, I want us to notice a fifth and final point. And that is the process of redemption. As we've looked through Ephesians chapter 1, we've noticed four things about redemption. We've talked about the product. We've noticed the price. We've talked about the person. And we've seen the picture. But let's notice the fifth and final one as he talks about the process here. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, now watch this last phrase, according to the riches of his grace. When we first introduced our study this morning, We talked about the fact that the King James Version of the Bible has over 780,000 words. And one of those words that we like to think about is the word grace. Because it's a word that means getting what we don't deserve. You know what we deserve? We deserve death. We deserve to be lost. But because of God, His great love, His mercy, and because of His grace, we're going to get what we don't deserve. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul is letting us know that redemption is only made possible through the grace of God. He says, For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. When we think about our salvation today, it comes through the grace of God. That's the process of it. But also as we think about redemption, it's important for us to understand that God has done His part, but you and I also have our part as well. We're not saved through grace alone. We're not saved through faith alone. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 5 and verse 9 that He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. And so as you and I look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, and we've gone through beginning there at the book of Exodus, 
and made our way through different passages in the Word of God this morning. I hope that you have a better understanding of the truth in regards to redemption and see how this book here is God's scheme of redemption. Will you bow with me very quickly as we close with a word of prayer? Our most righteous and loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much for the sending of Jesus to die on the cross. We're thankful for the shedding of the blood that was shed on that cross so that we could have the forgiveness of our sins, the hope of eternal life. We're so thankful for the rich blessings that are provided through Thy grace. We pray, Father, that You'll continue to watch over us each day as we seek to glorify and to, to praise Thee and to honor Thee with the way that we live. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.